first session of phylogenomics. Uh, so this is a uh, legal evolutionary story I'm going to tell using phylogenomic data uh, about the uh, evolution of agility and uh, island gigantism in the quake. So as a biogeographer, I've uh, long been interested in this so-called paradox of insular speciation. And that's if you have a archipelago uh, or really any sort of uh, geographic scenario with strong barriers that some organisms are dispersive enough to colonize across geographic boundaries, yet not dispersive enough to prevent isolation of those populations and subsequent diversification. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, schools of thought about um, how this scenario may play out in natural systems. So the first is kind of more from the neutral school of thought. Uh, in that you just have these rare chance events of dispersal and that over evolutionary time enough individuals will uh, happen to cross these barriers uh, enough to produce a population. Um, however, that's not the most satisfying answer in a lot of scenarios. Uh, for example, with this uh, kiwi down here, um, if it were to get to everywhere in the world, it would need a substantial adaptation in the form of wings, or at least a re-evolving a neuropigial gland to be able to waterproof its feathers. Um, and so that kind of causes us to look for more adaptive explanations, be they morphological, physiological, or behavioral, to uh, explain these uh, uh, disjunctions. And so in order to sort of test all the scenarios of this, it requires a lot of information. So first we need uh, to understand the geologic history of the areas uh, to actually be able to tell if um, marine uh, dispersal is um, uh, even an option or whether, like in the case of Beringia, for example, uh, simple uh, uh, cross-land colonizations are an explanation. We need well-resolved phylogenetic hypotheses. And then we need various tip data uh, to uh, further test these in the form of the, again, morphological, behavioral data uh, to understand these sorts of adaptations. So the group I'm talking about today broadly is the landfowl or the galliformes. So this is a clade of about 300 species of birds. Um, they're very widespread, found on all continents except Antarctica. Yet, they are considered to be very poor dispersers in general. And that is because that most galliforms have uh, sort of these short, uh, there we go, short rounded wings like this uh, that are only good for sort of these flights and short bursts. So most galliforms will just make a short burst of flight and then kind of glide to get away from a predator or perhaps a short burst to go up into a tree to roost. Um, but they're generally considered to be incapable of crossing uh, marine barriers. Uh, but there are a couple of exceptions to this rule. One is the megapodes, which is a group I'm not going to go into today. They're sister to all other galliformes. And the other group is the old world quail. Um, and old world quail have a very different wing shape than most galliforms. It's much longer and has a high aspect ratio, which is generally more uh, efficient for uh, flight and requires less power, less, less power, less uh, caloric output in order to maintain lift. Um, they also have very small body size, so they're going to have a, uh, a lower um, uh, wing loading, and they're also highly migratory. So most galliforms are very sedentary birds, whereas the quails are seasonal and in some cases long distance migrants. And as you might expect, with a strong difference in dispersal ability, uh, that has a great effect on their distribution. So here's a map of the sort of non-vagile galliforms, uh, those that have these wing shapes that are uh, uh, short and are not good dispersers. You'll see that uh, you know, they are on some islands, like the Sunda Shelf, where you've had very recent land connections during those sea level spans, but they're completely absent from oceanic islands. Whereas the Old World quail, on the other hand, are found on many islands, such as Macronesia, Indonesian islands, and they've colonized across walls of line. But it's not quite that simple, because there are a couple exceptions to my map that I showed previously about the so-called non-vagile galliforms. 
There are two species of partridges, one from Madagascar and one from New Guinea that are very partridge-like and non-dispersive in their gross morphology, yet they're on these oceanic islands uh, or islands where there's been no possibility that a galliform has gotten there without a uh, long-distance marine dispersal event. And so I was curious, if, is this example of kind of true rare dispersal where these generally poor dispersing birds did manage to make it out to an area where they uh, uh, formed a population, sort of the neutral school, uh, or is this an example of morphological change and these are actually relatives of vagile species and then have lost that ability to disperse altered that wing shape and so that they uh, appear more similar to the other non-vagile continental galliforms. And so uh, in order to look at this, first we needed a new tree because the uh, quails uh, are missing several important taxa, um, including these larger species on islands. And so uh, for this project, we uh, sampled ultra-conserved elements, or UCEs, using Illumina sequencing. Um, important, we use several key taxa from old museum specimens, which works fairly well with this target capture uh, approach. And so we're getting a number of taxa in here that have not been included in any previous phylogenetic study, molecular phylogenetic study. Um, beyond that, our uh, molecular methods were uh, pretty straightforward, some cleaning, uh, processing, tree inference, uh, to produce a, a new uh, galliform tree. And in addition to that, we collected uh, some morphological data uh, in order to characterize the uh, wing shapes of these birds. And so for that, we used the hand wing index uh, from this figure here. And so this is calculated by taking the length from the uh, wrist to the longest primary, uh, and then subtracting the distance from the uh, wrist to the longest secondary, and then scaling for wing size. And uh, when you do this, you come up with a metric that is very, very highly correlated with the aspect ratio. Uh, so basically a basic descriptor of the wing shape in these birds. Um, and this has been shown to uh, correlate very well with uh, dispersal abilities in, in lots and lots of different birds. And we also took some basic measurements of size, uh, and mass, and tarsus, and whatnot. And then with our new tree, we then did reconstructions to understand how these morphological uh, traits evolved on, on across the Galliform tree. All right, and so here's our, our uh, current uh, best tree based on UCEs of Galliform relationships. So this is about uh, 4,000 ultra-conserved element loci, about 2 million base pair. Um, and this is a uh, time-calibrated uh, tree based on the concatenated maximum likelihood tree. Uh, but the coalescent methods were very similar, only different in a couple nodes that weren't well resolved in either anyway, uh, and so we're fairly confident in this hypothesis. And uh, this is where you have your old world quail, kind of smack dab in the middle. Uh, they are nested within a clade of galliforms that include some familiar things like jungle fowls, also known as chickens, uh, and some partridges, uh, bush quail, uh, and then Going out one more node, those in turn are sister to a clay that contains the peafowl, uh, some pheasants, and some more partridges. Even further, you have grouse turkeys, other familiar birds, uh, other kinds of pheasants, and other kinds of partridges. So pheasants and partridges are common names that apply to lots of very uh, different uh, organisms that uh, are uh, convergent in their morphology, and we just kind of find pheasants and partridges all over the galliform tree. And going out even further towards the root, we have even more partridges, uh, the new world quail, which are not at all related to the old world quail, um, as well as some tropical taxa like guinea fowls, curassows, and then the uh, sister all their galliforms are these megapodes, the other diverse, dispersive group, which I'm not talking about. Uh, and so zooming in, this is our tree of the old world quail. Um, and this is a very well resolved part of the tree. We had uh, perfect bootstrap support and 1.0 uh, local posteriors is calculated an astral uh, on all of these nodes in this tree, which is very comforting. Um, but you'll notice that I actually have a couple of unlabeled tips here. And when I throw those in, lo and behold, we have our two 
partridge-like species that are present on Madagascar and in New Guinea, uh, Martyr Aquatix and Anurophasis. Uh, and then we go to look at the uh, morphometric results. This is a bivariate plot uh, based on the uh, tarsus, which is a uh, good metric for body size in birds. Uh, and then here's the handling index. So this is our measurement of wing shape or aspect ratio. And we see that the uh, coturnix, the old quail, occupy a unique space on this plot of uh, basically very long wings and very small body size. And when we add in Martyr Paradox and the Neurophasis, our partridge-like island species, we find they come out kind of right smack dab in the middle of our non-dispersive galliforms from, uh, from continents. And so when we then go to reconstruct that in a phylogenetic context, it shouldn't be that much of a surprise that um, we find the Old World Quail Clay, which is right here, uh, dark blue here represents a very high hand wing index scaled by body size, and then red uh, is a very low. And so our low, that's uh, curacaos and relatives. This one here, that's very high, that's uh, other large bodied things like uh, peafowl and argus pheasants. And um, uh, the quails have really occupy sort of their own, own uh, uh, color scheme in the part of this tree. But there's a little bit of difference in here, some green coming out of the dark blue. Uh, and that, of course, is our two uh, sort of giant quails. Um, all right. Um, uh, there. <clears throat> and so uh, the uh, Coturnus quails, they're small, they're dispersive, they're migratory, they have very long wings. These are sort of these key innovations that have promoted hemispheric colonization and dispersal across marine barriers. Whereas in our island partridges, our Anurophase and Margaret Paradox, they're very large bodied, sedentary, short wings, and convergent with the morphology of the partridges from continents. Uh, and I know this is sort of a new example of island gigantism in birds because it hasn't been clear what the relationships uh, of these taxa were. And it's kind of easy to imagine how this is sort of an intermediate state and with enough time and if this happens on islands with reduced predation and sort of thing, that you can get kind of these classic uh, island giants that are huge body size and lack flight entirely. So I'd like to uh, uh, thank museums, um, and funding sources and some other folks for uh, uh, help out with this project. And um, do we have any time for a question? We have, a, we have one minute. All right. For measuring the handling index, did you have to get flat mounted specimens or were there specimens and these specimens to do that? So this, yeah, so this is a measurement that's taken from flat wings, and that's really important because most birds, especially things that are from out of the way places where people haven't been allowed to go back and collect for 50 years, do not have spread wing measurements. So ideally we would use spread wings because you can get a lot more information out of those, uh, but the handling index is more of a, a rough measurement so that when you have really, really strong signal at least, that you can uh, start to address these questions. So you actually did have to use the standard specimens to get that measure. Yes, that's correct.